If there was ever a modern 3D platformer game that I feel everybody should try out, it's Little Nightmares. I've spoken about this game before now, but I can't not give it another shout out. It's a great little game with just the right mix of weighty physics, climbing around, puzzle solving, and generally creepy nonsense to really make it stand out from the crowd. Everything in Little Nightmares has this distinctive warped visual style, and the excellent camera work on display here really made a lot of these scenes look like a piece of concept art that's come to life. Despite not really being a fan of horror games, this, to me, is how you do it. Sure, it's not overtly scary and there's not much in the way of jump scares, but there's just this layer of creepiness and unease that's spread throughout the entire journey. Along the way, you'll be playing as this tiny person in a world full of monsters way bigger than you, except the monsters here just kind of seem like normal people on board this ship doing their own various tasks and jobs. And whatever story it's trying to tell you, it's done without a single word of dialogue, which is really impressive. Well, I mean, I barely understand the message it's trying to convey, but I still think it's really interesting to look at, especially when the world is as friggin' detailed as this one. There's no end of discussion and fan theory surrounding it all too, and the fact the team behind this game don't outright say what any of it means is great. I don't really want to know. It's kind of like looking into a painting by an artist that isn't there to explain its context anymore, so you just kind of have to take it all in and think about what it means to you, which, yeah, I mean, I guess I do that a lot anyway when I write these scripts, but I think that can apply to anybody when playing a game as freaky and weird as Little Nightmares. I'm never going to get that same blind playthrough experience ever again, but I did get to play through it again with a fresh coat of paint recently, thanks to this game's PS4 Pro support. I never had one of those, but I do have a PS5, and that acts as one by default with any of the PS4 stuff, so yeah, it's now running at 60fps too. Either which way, when a game has this much of an impact on me, especially one as short as Little Nightmares, I was just left wanting that little bit more, and although we did get some DLC, once that was over, there was just so much more potential left behind, so many questions left unanswered. Is the entire world full of these monsters? What about the rest of the landscape? What does that look like? Are there more people out there? What do normal places in this world look like? And what other mysterious things would we see with that absolutely masterful approach to camera work, composition, and lighting? Well, all that and more would be answered in Little Nightmares 2. When this game got announced, I could have done a friggin' backflip, because it was exactly what I wanted after playing the first game, and this just kinda came out of nowhere. I even slammed down a bit of extra money for this special edition too. I don't normally go for this kind of stuff, but after how much I enjoyed the first game, how could I not? Looking back, it is kind of annoying I don't have the first game's collector's edition, but I wasn't to know I was going to enjoy that game as much as I did. This time, I wasn't taking that chance. And just look at the little diorama that comes with it. Oh man, it's so good. Anyway, at this point, Little Nightmares 2 has been out for quite a while now, and I did intend to make a video on this closer to when it launched, but it turns out there's actually quite a lot of stuff going on in this game, so I ended up playing through it four times over the course of the last year, so... Yeah, that's why it's taken me so long to get around to this one, but one benefit of that is that this now has a free PS5 upgrade. You just put the disc in and then download the PS5 version, so yeah, that's how I'll be playing through this one today. So, first things first, and yeah, as usual, I gotta take some time to appreciate a good title screen. Very much a good hint that you'll be exploring a much bigger part of the world this time. Bonus points for you actually being able to go to this exact location at some point too. The game starts off with an eerie shot of a corridor before our new protagonist falls out of a TV in the middle of this spooky looking forest. Straight away, we do have some parallels with the original game, starting out with a creepy shot of something that's probably important, with the main character then waking up in a world we too know nothing about, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I love being thrown into the deep end with all of this creepy weird bullshit, and if the first game is anything to go by, then this world is only going to get more weird and interesting the further along we go. So yeah, this time we're not playing as Six from the original game, but instead we have Mono, this little guy with a little bag on his head. I do like his design, as it does make for an easy to understand outline 
fine if you keep that bag on there, which this game makes great use of in scenes like this later on. In fact, both of these games do a really good job of giving the main controllable characters a uniquely shaped silhouette, even in a simplified form on the logo, you know which one is which. As for controlling this little guy, well, if you've played the first game, then you're good to go, as the control scheme here is exactly the same as it was before. You can move, you can jump, and you can grab onto things with the right trigger, Little Big Planet style, which is handy for solving the odd puzzle here and there, and just generally getting around by climbing up and onto things. Yeah, there's not really a lot to report here, truth be told, but that's not a bad thing, I don't think, because the first game controlled just fine, and this one controls exactly the same, so yeah, there's no major issues. As for the stuff that is new, it's not a major thing compared to everything else I want to say in this video, but right away, one thing this game does better than the first one is the collectibles. Last time, I thought the little gnome dudes were okay to find. I mean, they did net you some pretty interesting looking concept art, but I do like the idea of getting different outfits and costumes to wear in games like this. You did get that back then in the form of some masks you could choose from. One of them you'd get for finding every hidden statue in the game, but the other ones were locked behind a pre order or a purchase of the season pass. This time, yeah, Little Nightmares 2 has exactly what I was after with a whole bunch of these little hats that you can find and wear. Again, it's not super important and thematically I feel like the paper bag is probably my favourite one anyway because it has that distinctive outline, but it is nice having an option for this kind of stuff. That said, it is a shame these hats have outright replaced the concept art though, instead of being an additional thing because man, some of the locations in this game are absolutely insane and I'd love to see as much of the concept art for them as I can. I mean, I guess I have that little art booklet that came with my collector's edition, but not everybody's gonna have access to that, so... Yeah, just go ahead and look for it online once you've beaten the game, I guess. I don't know. It's not all fancy visuals with the exact same gameplay as before though, as there is a little bit of variety thrown in here thanks to a few new gameplay mechanics, and this also being the story of two characters this time around. Yeah, so in the first game they did two stories playing in parallel, with the main game and the DLC taking place at around about the same time, but in Little Nightmares 2, this is a completely joint venture. Uh, well, I mean, it's not a completely joint venture, because you do get split up a couple of times, so it's a mostly joint venture. You may not be playing as her in this sequel, but that other kid following you around at times is Six from the original Little Nightmares. She'll even get her iconic yellow jacket back at one point to really hammer in that fact too, but there are a couple of times where you'll see her do some random aggressive behaviour towards things and it's like... Uh... Okay, that's definitely her. And going by the initial trailer for this one, I, and a lot of people I think, assumed that this would be some kind of two-player co-op game, but no, this is a fully single-player adventure. I was initially surprised by this, but in hindsight, I am so glad it remained a single-player game. I'm kind of already invested in this world and how it all looks, and I want to be able to take my time to soak it all in, so I'm glad I didn't have to drag a friend into me playing through this game four times just so I could stop every ten seconds seconds to stare at the scenery or some tiny piece of framed artwork on a table just so I could try and piece together some small clue. Nah, Little Nightmares 2 goes for your non-intrusive constant companion kind of gameplay, so if you think something closer to the likes of The Last of Us or Bioshock Infinite, that's pretty much what's going on here, but with Little Nightmares gameplay. It works really well for the pace of the story here too, as you're not always going to be together, and being pulled apart ends up being the driving force behind Mono pressing on through through this world at times, in order to build up trust between the two characters and get through a selection of different obstacles that need two pairs of hands. It's nothing huge or drastic or anything like that, but you know, you've got situations like having Six cause a distraction, or using her as a boost towards a ledge or a ladder, or as somebody to grab onto when making a long jump over a large gap. Again, The Last of Us is the one that really does spring to mind here. We've also got a bit of combat in here from time to time, which the first game pretty much had none of and only ever attempted once in the DLC, but yeah, here it is, usually in the form of grabbing a hammer or a stick and slamming it into these guys. <laughs> 
The animation and the sound design really does help this feel great as well, dragging these heavy items with the sound of them scraping against the floor as you go along just to friggin' destroy some of these smaller enemies with them. That said, I am thankful this doesn't pop up too often, at around three or four times throughout the entire game. I say that because I feel like the camera angle here can sometimes make it a little hard to judge where you're going to strike the hammer, but with the frequent and fast loading checkpoints, it's not a huge deal and ends up being a pretty decent addition, I think. As well as weapons, there's a few handheld items to use, with things like the flashlight, which is similar to the one that the first game had in its DLC. And man, the monsters you go up against with this thing share the top spot for the creepiest thing in Little Nightmares 2. These guys will only ever move when they're shrouded in darkness, so you've got to keep an eye on them and keep that light facing towards them for as long as you can. Later on, you'll get a TV remote, which is used for some traversal-based puzzles, as well as tricking a new enemy type into getting stuck or even killing themselves, but uh, yeah, more on that later on. So yeah, we've got a pretty decent selection of new things going on thanks to the two character dynamic, but none of it's really taking away from the overall foundation that the first game had, which is great. A solid mix of running, jumping, and a few puzzles here and there. This is good stuff. <laughs> But best of all, for me at least, is you get that grand sense of scale and excellent camera work that made the first game so interesting to look at return in full force. That singular wide shot in the original game, revealing it all to be set on a ship and that there's an entire world out there? Yeah, this game goes there. But then the dial gets cranked up to 11. Holy shit! Not long after starting out, you'll come across a little cabin in the woods to help cement that scale back into place, and man, the angles and the general level of detail in this game is already top notch, but I can't stress how much I completely love how nuts this game goes with its visuals at times. This is nothing compared to what happens later on in the game. After that opening chapter that takes place in the woods, you'll then ride a raft over to the other side of this lake, leading you to the Pale City, and this... This right here is where I ended up seeing so much stuff I was hoping to see from this world at the end of the first game. From here, you'll journey through the streets and end up seeing all manner of normal looking locations in this world, like apartment blocks, a school, a hospital, a morgue, all with that creepiness that the first game had, along with a whole ton of weird, surreal stuff the further you go into this. You know, like the first game had its moments of surrealism, but they were fairly grounded compared to what we have going on here, with the world sometimes reacting to you in strange ways, or connecting you to different areas through some really cool and freaky transitional set pieces. Oh, what the hell was that? You're just gonna show some kind of eyeball body horror flesh wall and then cut back here like nothing happened? Well, okay then. There's also a few times in Little Nightmares 2 where the depth of the scenery and the background elements found within are put to much better use. You know, like this isn't something that's needed in every single scene, but when you're running away from the hunter, you better watch out that the beam from his lantern doesn't reach you from all the way back there. And then you've got this, the way this tall tower is glowing and gaining everybody's attention and making them jump from the rooftops. It's super eerie, especially when you can see even more people doing it way off in the distance too, like... No! What are you doing? So yeah, there's definitely an element of depth that this game plays around with a lot more than the first one ever did, and that's because we're in much more open spaces this time around, so it only makes sense that Tarsia Studios would be playing that card to their advantage, and good lord, do they know what they're doing. Some of this lighting and camera work, it's like a moving painting with hidden messages sprinkled in, and like last time, whatever those messages may be, they're not all that easy to understand at first. I mean, even now, after multiple playthroughs and whilst editing this video, there's things I'm seeing and not fully understanding the message behind. But still, it makes me feel like Tarsia Studios were really leaning into the broader, abstract nature of dreams and nightmares with this game, instead of the more straightforward idea of taking on different fears represented through the monsters like in the first game. Because of course, not every nightmare has a monster in it. Some of them are just really weird and make no sense once you've woken up, and that's the kind of feeling I get from Little Nightmares 2.
That said, there's still plenty of freaky looking dudes in this game with some of these guys being really messed up. I guess there's maybe some spoilers here as I reckon your initial experience with these will come from the sheer shock of seeing how some of these guys act for the first time, but they are one of the main appeals of the game too, so I do want to show them at least a little bit, so skip on ahead if you don't want to know too much about them, but if not, then... Yeah, I'm gonna talk about them. So yeah, there's a good mix of messed up looking things chasing after you throughout your journey, like the hospital patients I mentioned earlier that react to light and shadows. These guys sound like a bowl of bones and plastic rattling around whenever they move, and the obsessive surgeon that seemingly created all of them clings onto the ceiling like a madman. What is he doing? Earlier on, you've got the hunter, this guy living in the woods who's clearly out there looking for something or someone, and he's incredibly hostile with him blasting his shot gun at you without hesitation, which means there's some really nerve-wracking chase sequences with this guy in the opening act. And in the city, we have these empty husks of what were once people, forever staring at the TV and the TV signal station itself, willing to do anything in order to keep things that way. But hands down, the one that creeped me out the most has to be this teacher that you come across in the school. I mean, at first, she's just your typical scary school teacher that I think we could all relate to from our younger years, but if you piss this lady off, she busts out the neck! <laughs> I don't know what it is here, because I can deal with most of the other creepiness this game throws my way, but there is something about this spaghetti neck woman that really unnerves me. Between her and the friggin' Lanky Kong janitor from the first game, you pretty much got all the bases covered there for me, like, forget that, I ain't going anywhere near these guys. Anyway, there is one other scary dude that pops up towards the third act of the game, but I'll save talking about him till later on, because that's where things start getting kind of interesting. As well as the monsters, there's also some recurring elements from the first game that get seen again and fleshed out a little more this time around. The symbol of an eye watching over your every move is one of those things I picked up on the most. So in the first game, I had a feeling that eye was something these people were almost taught to be scared of as a society because it's everywhere on board the moor and a lot of the time it's in the areas you're not supposed to see or presented in a context that makes it seem like it has some real significance within this world. It was on the doors to see everybody coming and going. It was on the bed frames to remind them that even while sleeping, the eye is watching over them. And it was in a bunch of paintings, as something an artist can envision in their mind, but never fully reproduce a physical image of. And even the security systems on board the mall were modelled after the eye, both with the cameras and the monitors. But then, it's all over the place when you visit the rest of the world too. There it is, atop the entrance to the school, where inside, children will scribble pictures of the eye in panic, as if they're in constant fear of it. There's also a lot of little narrative threads across both games that are kind of fun to notice and put together too once you start seeing them. Like the DLC for the first game, you can see these portraits on the wall and you have to interact with them for this kind of puzzle, and one of them is the teacher from Little Nightmares 2. I swear, all of this is like one of those massive idea boards tied together with strings and pins and stuff. It looks like complete madness to anybody else, but to those in the know, it's pretty interesting stuff, and I am definitely one of those people. The biggest new mystery in all of this has to do with those television sets though, with them pretty much being the entire thing the story and marketing for this game was built around. I mean, did anybody else actually finish the DLC for the first game and then sit around until the end of the credits? Because, yeah, you get a teaser for what's about to come next, all from the screen of an old TV. Not to mention that little diorama that you get with the collector's edition of Little Nightmares 2. It's all about that TV. But yeah, not only is our character pulled through one of these TVs at the very start of the game, but these things are constantly shown as being pretty dangerous within this world, with people discarding them out in the woods or on the rainy streets of the city. And of course, we've got the hollow shells of the people that were watching these TVs, trapped, staring at the screens for all eternity, doing everything it tells them to do without ever thinking for themselves. At the centre of it all is this corridor that Mono keeps stumbling across through his interactions with some of the working TVs throughout the world. It's that same corridor from the opening shot of the game, and each time we visit, we inch closer and closer before being pulled away. In the final visit, Mono manages to open the door, and this towering man is set free and sets his gaze upon our two little protagonists. There is a bit more I do want to say about this guy, but I'll save that for when I talk about the spoilers, because he is a pretty important character by the end of it. 
So, yeah, if you want the short version of my opinion, then Little Nightmares 2 is really good. If you like the first game, which I would also recommend, you're gonna like this one. There's no doubt about that. You've got the same kind of gameplay with new locations, new monsters, a new story with the same amount if not more polish than before and this one is twice as long as the original game at around 5 hours or so in length. And yeah, that's not the longest playtime in the world, obviously, but this game was never really priced as a big AAA game anyway, even when it launched, and I reckon this is a quality over quantity type situation, really. But either which way, while I've spent a whole bunch of time singing its praises, I mean, Little Nightmares 2 does have a couple things I'm not overly keen on. I mentioned it earlier on how the camera angles here don't always make these combat sections the most readable with the depth perception, and while I've always had access to it myself, it does kind of suck that the only time you ever see the gnome guys from the first game return is within this little area earlier on that's then locked behind a DLC that came with the day one editions and the special editions. You can at least buy this separately now but the price you pay for this isn't really ideal considering it's just the one extra room with a puzzle in it and a hat that you get as a reward. But yeah that along with the occasionally iffy combat camera angles are the only real issues I have here so that's kind of saying something in and of itself, I think, which means, yeah, Little Nightmares 2 is pretty solid. It's available on pretty much all of the main systems out there, with a free upgrade to an even nicer version if you're on PC or any of the newer Xboxes and Playstations. And the Nintendo Switch version seems to run just fine from what I've played with the demos, so yeah, can't really recommend this one enough really, especially if you enjoyed the first game. Yeah. So, it probably seems a bit weird that I made such a grand summary midway through the video before I've even talked about the ending, but what an ending this game has, and I do not want to be the guy that ruins it for you, so if you like what you've seen of the game so far, or if you enjoyed the first one, just go for it. Play Little Nightmares 2, and then come back here some other time, because I don't want to be the guy that spoils it, but... If you do want to stick around, then not only am I going to talk about how Little Nightmares 2 ends, but I've got to talk about what I think it means for the franchise as a whole, because this game opens up a massive can of worms, and I can't not talk about it. So, after making their way through the forest, and then briefly being separated at the school, and then through the hospital, the morgue, and the pale city streets, we get to that scene I mentioned earlier on, where the thin man crawls out of the television set and starts chasing down our little friends. This all ends up with Six being taken away through the TV. This eventually leads Mono to the tower that's broadcasting this signal across the city, culminating in a one-on-one -on -one fight against the thin man, where Mono is actually able to win. It seems like he was able to maybe absorb some of that power through all of his recent usage of the TV screens. And then we head into the tower itself to find out where Six is and free her. And this is where the game starts to get really abstract with loads of floating objects and endless impossible corridors connected together through these spindly staircases that seemingly lead nowhere. Almost like this place exists within its own bubble away from the rest of the world. It's pretty cool that you have to rely on sound for these parts too, but not just any sound, the sound of the music box that Six was playing with when Mono first found her in the hunter's basement. And when Mono eventually finds Six, she's in this huge, monstrous form, clutching onto the music box as it's the only thing calming her down, just as it was when they first met. After destroying the music box, Six reverts back to her regular form, which seems to anger the tower itself, making it reveal its true form. Out of nowhere, the entire place becomes this massive, pulsating flesh and eyeball monster chasing the two protagonists all the way to the exit and after a very close call with the two of them just narrowly escaping death it all comes down to this one final leap of faith but six she hesitates and then she lets go of mono and leaves without him uh, fuck this clown on my first playthrough, I really did not see any of this entire ending sequence coming whatsoever. I was just so busy trying to recover from my jaw hitting the floor at all of this abstract visual madness going on, and realising that I was right about the eye having some sort of major significance in this world, that the emotional twist at the end of the game hit ten times harder than it would have alone. I mean, you spend pretty much the entire game building up the trust between these two characters, even going out of your way to save Sid on two separate occasions for it to all end in betrayal at the very last second. 
Okay, so it turns out this game seriously has one of the best gut-wrenching and emotionally hitting twist endings I think I've ever seen play out before me in any medium. And like the first game, this doesn't even have any dialogue, so yeah, go figure. Seriously, I think this entire scene is perfect in its execution after everything you've gone through in order to reach it. Every time you do this long jump manoeuvre with Six after the very first one is a fairly seamless movement between the two characters as they've gotten used to doing it and just generally working with one another in order to get by. But here, when you see Six hesitate and then you see Mono look down into the abyss, that's the moment when you know something ain't right. After this, we see what happened to Mono while he's down there, trapped in this endless void of flesh and eyes, watching him, screaming at him, and then... Silence. After drowning it all out, Mono just sits down and contemplates what just happened, forever, until he grows up to become the one partially responsible for triggering the chain reaction of events that led up to him being in the situation he is, trapped behind that door at the end of the corridor. Man, what a cool ending. There is one more twist to it if you manage to collect all of these glitching remains though, so yeah, whenever the Thin Man is able to grab somebody, they always leave behind this sort of residual energy, which you can see happen to Six when she gets taken away. There's a few of these dotted throughout the game for you to find, and if you get them all, then you'll get one last piece of the puzzle and see what happened to Six after she left the tower. She lands safely in another place at the other end of a TV set when her own glitchy shadow appears appears and shows her a leaflet for the Moor, which is the ship from the first game. We then hear her stomach rumble before a fade to the credits, which means Little Nightmares 2 is actually a prequel to the original game. Huh. Okay then. So, yeah. Uh... That's how it ends, I guess. Um, I'm not just going to talk about what happened in the ending, though, because there's a lot to take in with this game, and a lot of it is super open to each person's interpretation of it, which is basically why it's taken me so long to make this video. But uh, yeah, like I said, I've played through the game four times. I've made a whole bunch of notes, and with those notes, I'm going to tell you what I think this all means, at least to me. So... Uh, yeah, grab your scuba gear, because we are going for a deep dive into whatever this means. Right, okay, where do I begin? Well, I definitely think there's some kind of time loop happening here, with Mono destined to become trapped, grow older, and eventually be defeated by his younger self over and over again. But I don't think he ends up being inherently evil, but instead corrupted by the influence of the Signal Tower, which itself I think is some sort of sentient, shape-shifting monster that not only feeds on the life force of everything around it, but also creates or even is some kind of time and space anomaly, which is why everything inside of it doesn't really make sense to the outside world and how Mono manages to escape as a grown man before he's even arrived there as a child. On its own, I imagine this eye monster would only be able to feed on anything that's directly near it, like we saw at the end of the game. But thanks to having an entity like Mono trapped within it, who has proven to have some sort of control over TV signals, the eye monster is able to use that power to disguise itself as a broadcasting tower and send its life-draining signal out much further than it would be able to on its own. And if Mono is the reason it's able to spread this signal out that far, well, the Eye Monster pretty much always has access to that power because, in reality, it only ended up going about 10 minutes or so without Mono under its control, between the time it took Mono killing the Thin Man and then succumbing to the tower himself after being slam-dunked into the Abyss by Six. As for what this signal does to the people of this world, well, I think it's a combination of causing those with a weaker mind to become the husks that we saw in the city, and eventually die or simply fade away into nothing from overexposure to the signal, which would explain why there's so many random piles of clothing within the city walls. Those with a stronger mind, however, are able to resist it, or it could be completely random, I don't know. But either which way, some do survive the tower signal, but at the expense of having their bodies warped into these horrifying shapes. 
like we saw happen to Six when she was trapped inside the tower, and why Mono, instead of growing into an adult of the same proportions, becomes this stretched out thin man because he was in constant proximity to the reality bending power of the eye. This is also why I reckon we see the surgeon crafting masks for these people to wear, for those who have been affected by all of this, but want to hide what they've become and try to live as normal a life as they can. I mean, one of those masks is straight up the same one that the janitor has from the first game too, and it might also explain why he wears it incorrectly to cover his eyes, because we do see that he does still like the TV, but he just can't risk looking at it, because the signal only affects those that are using their eyes. Yeah, so this is what I meant about the eye being some kind of cultural fear within the world of Little Nightmares. It's just a theory I've had in my head ever since I played the first game, you know, the way it's depicted in paintings, scribbles, and even as an authoritative figure in the real world. It just kind of made me think that it was based on something that everybody fears as it watches over them. And I think I was right? Anyway, whatever this eye monster may have originally been, I think it just lurked in the background, unable to do much other than be in the minds of those who were aware it was there, reminding them that they're always seen until one day it possesses the power to look directly into the eyes of those stupid enough to be staring at a television set, and making them do whatever it says, absorbing their life force and even their bodies to feed its ever-growing, fleshy, physical form. And while I reckon the Thin Man is kind of trapped into doing the tower bidding, I think he does have some sense of free will because of what he does when he escapes from that room, only going after Six at first because he remembers that she is the one that caused him to be trapped in there in the first place. But inversely, I think that's also the reason Six dropped Mono when she did, because this is the only point of the game where she sees Mono's face as he's not wearing the bag on his head, and she probably saw the resemblance between him and the man that trapped her in the tower. Then of course you can go back to the first game with all of this information and start to think about what it means in a different light as well, so yeah, I also think the TV signal is probably the reason the moor ended up being built in the first place, as a means of people having some kind of normal life experience, you know, as a holiday resort far away from where the signal is actually able to reach them. But even then, out of fear, nobody can be sure that this signal can't reach them. I mean, what would you do? Would you switch a TV on and have a look at it just in case? No, of course not, you wouldn't take that risk. And so even if this eye can't directly see these people, it's there, lurking in the back of their heads, and why the only TV that's still regularly switched on has its owner terrified to even look at it. But obviously, if you go into these games blind and play them from the perspective of somebody so small, it doesn't seem that way, it just seems like the world is full of these crazy looking monsters. And that is why I think these games are so cool. They're just really interesting to think about, you know? So, I'm pretty sure that is everything I had on my mind about this game and the franchise as a whole. And you know what? I could be wrong about literally everything I just said in that massive conspiracy theory spoiler rabbit hole section of the video. And I don't even mind. These games are super abstract after all, and I like that everybody can maybe piece together something different from what they see along the way. It definitely makes not being told what it all means all the more interesting to discuss with others. And that's why it's taken me four playthroughs and an entire chunk of this video dedicated to talking about what I think it all means. But yeah, it's probably pretty obvious at this point that I really like this game just as much, if not more, than the first one, but they really are best when together. They both have slightly different different atmospheres and stories to tell, but the overall thing they're going for, whatever that might be, is right up my alley. Which is still kind of surprising to me, because up until now I've kept saying I don't really do horror games, but maybe I do, I don't know. Either which way, the series is just so neat and so interesting, so yeah, please just give these games a try. But yeah, for now, to end this video, I'll just talk about the uncertain nature of this franchise's future, because since the second game came out, Tarsia Studios have been acquired by one company, but the rights to this franchise remain with Bandai Namco, so... I don't really know whether or not we're going to see any more of this little nightmare in the future, and if we do, it's probably not going to be by their hands, but either which way, it's been a great ride while it lasted, and I've got two games that I can recommend to pretty much everyone.